Okay, let's get started. What are we going to do today? We're going to finish the graphic pipeline lecture. This was the OLG RPL lecture. We stopped on slide 70 something, but before we get there, I'm going to kind of review a little bit. Um, 72, I think, or something around that nature. Yeah, so we were covering this one, the classical rendering pipeline, and an overview of it. Talking about the rendering process, and we broke it out. I broke it out into a couple of steps the open space, the model view transformation, view space projection, normalizing the view space, viewpoint mapping, and then the space for the screen or the screen space. And this is a bunch of terminology. The purpose of this lecture was to give you all the terminology and uh, talked about the model space and all the different components and the world transformations, um, placing the camera, camera angle, transformation angles, view space. The concept of back face cooling and getting rid of the seams that we can't see from behind. The concept of surface normals was actually also covered. The facing. Uh, let's see. We'll look at clipping and volume clipping. Basically not rendering what we don't have to render because it's out of the, of the viewing range in terms of our definition. There's our view volume clipping in terms of a little, and that's a little picture, it kind of gives us a, the perspective of what it is we're trying to define. And then we talk about lighting and the different kinds of lighting and real world lighting that's absorbed, reflected, and then transmitted. And that light that transmits from one object to another object as well. And we looked at the different lighting models that are supported in different graphic packages. Also briefly defined a tra ray tracing and radiosity in terms of those concepts. And we looked at the different models. And this is just a brain dump of a bunch of information concerning all of the different components. What you're going to work with is what you're going to get in whatever graphic package you happen to select. And uh, OpenGL and VRML support the same things because VRML is built on top of OpenGL. It's a regular base. In fact, um, the Mac OS X operating system is OpenGL. So it supports everything OpenGL supports as well in terms of that interface. Uh, Windows systems we have slightly different kind of graphic model that's being used for the GUI and for the development and also packages are kind of go along with the platforms that they're supported on um, as a side comment. Uh, so we looked at the fuse uh, lighting, we looked at specular lighting and uh, looked at also ambient lighting, uh, we looked at and I'm kind of trying to get to the ambient, here's our ambient lighting defining what those particular types are looked at illustration illumination models, excuse me, and I mentioned before not to be concerned with the calculations that are going into all of the different um, definitions. Um, if you were implementing this, creating your own language system to work with the color concepts and the lighting concepts, then you might be interested in knowing how to formulate the equations that are going to give us the different effects. Uh, incident lighting as a light color and then looking at color, also looked at the concept of color and open GL models for ambient diffuse specular. So basically color and lighting are similar in concept, but we have material color for different types of surface effects, a flat surface, a shiny surface, uh, an absorbed surface. Uh, so we looked at different types of color. Here's a white light versus a green light and coloring of lights actually and emissive models allow you to make objects more emissive or to glow so they emit light in terms of absorb light. Uh, attenuation as a concept was also looked at and uh, light sources, the pin light, the point light, the directional light, spotlights, extended lights, and these are just a model put together to describe the different types of lighting sources obviously. Depends upon the graphic package you're working with in terms of what light sources and what options are going to be available to you. But this is sort of the standard set that's a, used in OpenGL. Also talked about the concept of projection and how projection works. So it takes again the 2D scene and breaks it out into a 3D scene, breaks it out into a 2D scene because our flat display monitors are 2D, but we're modeling in 3D. So that's where our projection plays a part. And we looked at different models. So there's several different types of projection, orthographic perspective, stereographic projections as an example that was demonstrated here. And we looked at the different projection models in terms of their definitions and uh, how they're applied. And then projections in OpenGL and uh, calculations. And then normalizing the device space uh, that is making things look correctly, um, doing 2D clipping, 
pixel shading, hidden surface removal, and texture mapping is what we're going to hit next. So I probably stopped a little bit after this slide, but I sort of want to start here only because this is picking up on the concepts to be covered in the next part. So the major operations that happen in our space, we have clipping as a concept. And clipping is going to help us with the rendering process and make that more suitable for the display. But it also it's going to make it so we're only rendering what we need to render at the time that we need to render it. Pixel shading is another concept that can be applied given all of the other information about the scene. And then hidden surface removal, just getting rid of surfaces that we can't see. And then the concept of texture mapping, uh, which we've actually seen in VRML, but we'll see the concepts behind it in terms of the theory today. So 2D clipping. So in a 3D model, uh, they're clipped against a view volume, triangles that are partially inside the view volume are kept. Anything outside of the view volume is taken away, which is why we're concerned with this whole view volume kind of concept. We want the, we only want to render what we can see, because it doesn't really make very much sense otherwise. And we have a 3D that we're going to render down into a 2D image, and then we're going to clip out anything that's not inside of the view. Um, and so we're going to decide where our surface normals are, Present those in a facing direction, and then clip the back, clip the sides, clip the top, clip the bottom, clip whatever we can. So 2D clipping is what's clipping the 3D to the 2D for the display, because we don't see it. And so it's a calculation that is performed during the rendering process that figures out what can we clip. <laughs> so without any clipping at all, things render a little bit slower. Um, so it depends on that type of application that you're trying to trying to put together in terms of how much clipping you're going to want to do. If it's a fast-moving animated scene like a game program, you're not going to want to do very much clipping because your scene's going to change rapidly. You don't want to render on the fly. It's better to pre-render everything, get it so that when the scene moves and the object rotates, it's filled in automatically. And so once the view clips, excuse me, once the view um, volume changes, then we don't have to worry about re-rendering. So we're going to use clipping in sort of a application by application or a purpose by purpose sort of technique. Some of these uh, triangles here make it uh, to the stage. Here, as in this example down here, we have parts that hang outside of the window while these parts are clipped. Why do they use the word clipped? It's kind of like scissors, you know, clipping it away, cutting it away. We also have the concept of pixel shading, which gives us our color and our effects. So the lighting equations that we've seen obtain a color at a particular vertex. So we take the color and we can apply an algorithm to shade it, which we can blend color sequences together so we don't have any discrete lines between color changes, which is how we're going to get realistic shading. Because if you think about the concept of shade, I should just go outside on the beach on a hot summer day and you know, look at the shade that an umbrella gives you and look at the pattern it makes on the ground. Hard to do that on computer graphics without applying some algorithms to, to blend um, shading and also to perform different shading contrasts and different shading characteristics you know, so that something is going to blend sharper or smoother from color to color. Also, we can use color for shading. And we think that grayscale is grayscale, but we can add color to the shading actually and add some interesting effects to it. So pixel shading is all about taking those colors and coloring each pixel in a triangle and coloring it evenly. So there's three main models to shading. That's the flat shading, ground shading, and prong shading. So not to be confused with prong local reflective models previously discussed. I actually covered those last week. So this isn't the reflective, but prong is the guy. His, actually, it's his last name. He was the one who used and he invented a couple of different concepts of lighting and shading. So his shading model is completely different from his lighting model, but it's his philosophy. So the easiest one to look at is this flat shading concept. <laughs> so in flat shading, single color is computed, computed, is computed the triangle at the center of the triangle using normals of the triangle surface as n, so it goes out to a certain n degrees depending upon how far the shading area is supposed to extend. So the computer color is used to shade every pixel in the triangle uniformly. So the shade is all of the same color. There's no lighter or darker contrasts of it. So you start in a starting location and you move outward in whatever in angle 
I'm supposed to be moving it in. Because, you know, if you think about the concept of shading, it's not always uniform. Sometimes we have circular, some, it's not ever square. I mean, unless we have a square object that we're projecting shade off of. And you can actually easily kind of comp compare all of this stuff by looking at natural shading that occurs in life. So you produce images that are clearly show the underlying polygons underneath them. And they're illuminated or they're shaded, depending upon the contrast. In uh, OpenGL, we run a GL shade model. We give it GL flat as a characteristic, so if we want to do flat. So the thing to consider with flat is it's all shaded at the same intensity level. So it's all the same color. So here's a flat shading example. And uh, where we see, do we see shading here? And we see a little bit of shading here. Actually, it's all the same color in terms of the light. So we see a little lightness here and a little shading behind it, actually, too. So, which kind of gives it an interesting effect. We know that the light source is coming in this way, actually. So our ground shading, the three colors are computed for the triangle at each vertex using a neighboring averaging normal as each end. So we do an average between the neighboring polygons so that we can provide a, a blend. So we have, can go from a light to a dark or dark to a light. So it's not all, in, flat is an even shading. This one here is uh, uneven. Instead it's uh, gathered in a general, or a, what do you call it, a uh, gradual transition from a dark to a light or light to a dark, which adds a little bit more realistic shading to the scene. So what is the neighboring average normal? Well, that's a good question. It depends on the calculation that you're providing. So the average of the surface normals of all triangles that share this vertex. So you take the surface normals, you average it out, and you can shade to a certain point and then contrast it. So if the triangle model is approximating an analytical surface, then normals could be computed directly from the surface descriptions. And did this with the sphere example in the lighting model. Actually, we saw that in a previous last time, actually. So we have a bilinear uh, interpopulation that is used to shade the pixels of three vertex colors. Interpopulating happens in 2D versus 3D. So the advantage of this shading over the flat shading is that the underlying polygon structure can't be seen. In the flat shading, you can see the underlying polygon structure, which means you can see the vertexes, and you can see the lines in between the polygons. With this type of shading, I call it for lack of a better word, I usually say it's smooth or it's blended. Well, that's what you're using here. So the, the OpenGL is going to use the word smooth actually to describe it, which means you can't see the transition between the different polygons, that they're going to be transitioned from a lighter to a darker. So there's going to be more blending. <clears throat> so here we would use a GL shade model, GL smooth, as a modeling approach to smooth the uh, shading between the polygons. And here's an example here where we see it's a little bit lighter here and then it goes darker. Darker, you probably can't, uh, if you download the slide set, you can probably see a little bit better. The screen doesn't do a good job with contrast, but uh, it's gradually going darker to the point where you actually, I can still see it, but you probably can't see the, uh, the part that's down here that's black actually. So the problem with ground shading is that uh, specular highlights don't interpopulate correctly which is an interesting phenomenon that occurs here, which means uh, we got a little spotlight here, but we're not going to be able to see other types of lights that might actually populate. It's not going to interpopulate as we'd see it. So if the object isn't constructed with enough triangles, and we have artifacts that can be seen, quick drop-offs, actually. So most of it might not necessarily render correctly, depending upon what we're looking at. And lo and behold, we have the prong shading. So many colors are computed for a particular triangle. So at the back portion, a uh, projection, excuse me, of each one of the triangles, it's projected onto a 3D triangle. So using the normals, we have a bilinear interpopulation in a 2D model, very similar to the ground shading uh, from the normals. And at we're using three vertices instead. So we're using, instead of just one as a central point, we're using more than one, we're using three, this particular model. So the normals, at the three vertices are still computed with neighboring averages. So it's really a combination of both techniques, but it's more lending towards the pro, excuse me, the uh, ground concept. And uh, it's not as smooth 
because it's not it's taking approximation to three pixels and then it's taking the vertices into consideration as well so it's doing the smoothing as well so each pixel gets its own computed color we have more computation going on for the computed color it adds for a more evenly shaded kind of environment so the advantages that the shading has over ground shading is that it allows for interior of the triangle to contain specular highlights. So if we're using more points within each one of the triangles, we can highlight because we can focus light and we can focus shading from three instead of just one center point of each one of the areas. And the disadvantage is it's easily to have four times, four to five times more expensive because instead of doing one calculation, we're doing three. So we're increasing the computation that's needed from a single, you know, just first from a, we just take the flat model, it takes the center point of the triangle and it evenly spreads out the shade for the entire, uh, for the entire shape, or excuse me, for the entire triangle. Here we're taking three points instead of one point, we're applying the same concept, but now we have three reference points so we can apply some unevenness in terms of light contrast or something. So. OpenGL doesn't support prong shading. It's too expensive in terms of uh, computational time. But other more expensive slash more robust graphic packages would support this model. So. And here's an example here where we've got the ability to sort of change this guy here. So this is a, a little shading that comes from the light that comes in. So we can sort of see the contrast. And we also see up here the shading. In fact, we see a lighter bright heat, lighter light here, then we see the less light, but still illuminated, and then we see the darker contrast for the shade. It gives us more a realistic effect, but it costs more in rendering time. So this is where we actually stopped, I believe, in terms of sharing shading comparison examples. We have the wire frame, and as mentioned before, as an example of wire framing, we're looking at nothing. It's empty. It's, it's just the framing of the these are each one of the different polygons that we have defined for each one of the you know, components that we're going to apply some shade or color to. The flat gives us, in, in the flat model, we can see the vertices because we're not taking those into consideration. We're just filling in each one of the polygons with a color, in this particular case, a shade of gray. And uh, we're not really doing any approximation for any smoothing between any of the polygons. So we, we see this wireframe that kind of pokes through pokes through the shape the ground and the prong in this picture you can't really tell a significant difference which is why most graphic packages the lower end like OpenGL doesn't support the prong because it doesn't give us that much more to it although we can see that we have a little bit of lighter we have multiple lighter contrasts with this because we have three times the amount of um, averaging going on over here we have just a simple smoothing that's happening between each one of the polygons. So you can sort of see how the shading is blended around. So it really depends on the look and feel you're looking for. Cheaper packages are going to do a flat shading, which doesn't take into any calculations at all. Expensive packages are going to be looking at a prong shading model probably, depending upon what you're looking at. So outside of shading, moving on to another concept, we have the hidden surface removal. So taking surfaces is exactly how it sounds, actually, that are invisible and then removing them. So the problem is that we have polygons that overlap in the image, and we want to make sure that the one in front shows up in front and the one behind doesn't get rendered. So we have several different ways to solve this problem. The two most popular ways, one's called the painter's algorithm, and the other one's called the z-buffer algorithm. Z-buffer algorithm is supported by OpenGL, so is Painters. But uh, Z-buffering is a little bit better, uh, but it's more time consuming as well. So let's like, take a look at the Painters algorithm first. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, the view volume, calculate all of the facing surfaces, and see which surfaces are not facing after we've done all of the layering of everything, and then remove all of the surfaces that are not visible so we don't have to render them. So we sort the polygons by the depth from the camera. So we have the camera position, and we go, okay, what's in front of which? We paint the polygons in the order from the farthest to the nearest, so the blue one gets painted and then the green one gets painted after it. And then when this little area here can be removed because it's a hidden surface. 
which is where, what we're doing for the calculation. So there's two major problems with the painter's algorithm. It's wasteful, um, wasteful of time, because every polygon gets drawn on the screen, even if it's entirely hidden. Because in this particular case, we're going to draw this one, and then we're going to draw this one, and then we're going to remove it. <laughs> so, and we're not necessarily going to draw and remove, we're going to calculate. And the calculating time is more expensive than the drawing time. So if we're going to consider that information, it's pretty wasteful. Uh, and let's see, only handles polygons that don't overlap in the Z coordinate. And it's two-dimensional, so it doesn't handle everything. Um, so we don't know about uh, the Z, that don't overlap in the Z coordinates. So we, we forget about the Z coordinate position, and we're only looking at the flat surface. So we could have a situation in which we have an overlap, which is not taken care of. Then Z buffering came along as a solution to the painter's algorithm. But Z buffering is more time intensive. So Z buffering is what OpenGL and um, actually VRML uses. So the painter's uh, is an object-based. So the Z buffering algorithm is a pixel-based, not object-based. So instead it looks at pixel per pixel and it's kind of like garbage collection, actually. It looks at, is it taken? Is it taken? Is it taken? If it's not taken, it's free. If it's taken and somebody else goes to take it, it doesn't get taken, it doesn't get rendered. So it stops the rendering, it stops the population after it's already been marked as filled. So if you start at the beginning of the camera lens and you fill it the opposite direction, you know it's not going to be painted because it's already taking up a space or a pixel that's already been populated by another pixel, it's not going to overwrite it, um, which is one way of doing it. So you have a buffer of identical size to the color buffer, and it's called, well, it's created, and it's called the Z buffer, or the depth buffer. So we call it the color buffer, where the resulting colors are placed. We have a two color buffer when uh, we have a double buffering kind of system. So the values of the Z buffer are all set to the maximum. And the range of the depth values in the view volume is mapped. So if we have the 0, 0 .0 to 1 0.0. In OpenGL, we just call a function. We say clear the depth. Now apply the depth buffer bit so we can fill it in. So we buffer the information essentially and populate it. But if it's already in there, because we already are keeping track of it, we don't populate it twice. So then we can generate an image that only works with the, whatever it happens to be the first visible location. So pixel by pixel instead of object by object. So for each object, for each projected pixel in the object XY, if the Z value of the current pixel is less than the Z value of the XY, then color the pixel at the XY in the color bit because it's closer. We then replace the value of XY in the Z buffer with the current Z value. So we're going to replace it with whatever is the current Else, don't do anything because previously render object is closer to the view at the projected XY location, and we don't have to do anything. So we don't have to repaint anything because we already have a view that's closer. So it basically keeps track of um, everything in a buffer and kind of sees that uh, if it's there, you don't have to repaint it because it's not visible. You can mark it. Problems: objects can be drawn in any order. It doesn't really matter what order because uh, we're only going to draw what's visible. And the objects can overlap in depth, yes. And the hardware support is almost every is supported by almost every graphics card. So because it's just buffer memory that's being used for it. Cons is the memory cost. So the cost is 1024 by 768. It's going to be larger than 786 pixels. So at four bytes per pixel, we're looking at three megabytes of uh, data needed. Or four bytes, often necessary to get a resolution we want to, to that particular bit. So, long story short, because we're buffering, we're using up a lot of memory, and so you need a graphics card that has a lot of memory available to it. And some pixels are still drawn and then replaced because they're unnecessary. And problems with transparent objects. A transparent object for which you can see through isn't going to be able to see what's on the underneath it because what's underneath it's not painted. So you can't use Z-buffering algorithms with transparent objects because you can't, uh, you can't see through it. So Painter's algorithm actually makes more sense for transparent objects. So Z-buffer algorithms and transparency, you can modify it. So transparent colors need to be blended with the colors of the op 
opaque object behind it. So there's different blending functions. We'll look at this more later, but uh, to make the blending work, the correct opaque color needs to be known. And then the opaque objects need to be drawn before the transparent ones are drawn. So we can see the color underneath it. However, we still, need to have, we still have the following problem. Well, black is opaque drawn first, blue transparent drawn second. We have to figure out the order, otherwise one's going to outblend the other one. And we're going to get a bad contrast, unrealistic looking um, transparency. So in terms of the problem, if the blue sets the z-buffer to its depth value, then the red is assumed to be blocked by the blue and won't get its color blended properly. So, And as a solution, you order the transparent objects from back to front. So it's painting the black first, and then it's painting the front on top of it. So the order in which you're applying the coloring from the buffered pixels is going to determine how realistic, as you can be able to determine what's going to be seen. So you can turn off C buffering and test for transparent objects. If it fails, the transparent object won't be blocked by an opaque object. So most graphic packages, including OpenGL, allows you to turn on and off Z buffering, as it might make uh, for better performance if you turn it off uh, for opaque objects, so for see-through objects. Uh, so let's see, uh, a correct solution may also be to make the z-buffer uh, be read-only during the drawing of the transparent objects. And then uh, the buffer's tests are still done, so the opaque objects block transparent objects and, uh, that are behind them. Uh, but the values can't change, so transparent objects don't block other transparent objects that might be behind them. So we can use these two OpenGL ones, uh, function calls, the ones that depth the mask with GL true or GL false. Make it read only, we'll make it write only. If it's read only, it can't change, so we're not going to contrast it. So the you know, transparent front's not going to change the one behind it. So deep Z buffering for purposes of this course, it, think of it sort of like the way that we're going to render the, um, the picture pixel by pixel. So Z buffering works with pixel by pixel, and it calculates out the closest object to the camera, and it renders out everything behind it. Transparency is always an issue with that. Painter's algorithm doesn't do pixel by pixel. It does object by object. So it calculates the entire object, whether or not we're going to see the entire object. So it's not quite as effective, or efficient, I should say, as Z buffering algorithms where it only does one, the pixels that are needed. And if you're going to Z buffer it, you're going to take up a lot of memory because you have to store all of the pixel information. A lot more information than storing shape information. Shape information can be automatically generated from a few points to, to create a shape and uh, less memory intensive, but not as accurate. <laughs> so each one of them has, each one of them is used, but has pros and cons essentially to it. Texture mapping very popular, supported in mostly all graphic applications. You take a wireframe, and instead of putting an artificial color, a shade, a light, or something on it, you put a graphics file. You put a picture. So texture mapping is very popular to make realism. So you put the actual person's face on the robot. You can actually do it in a 3D fashion, so you have the ears on the sides and the, you know, everything proportioned correctly for a human. You can make a pretty realistic 3D model of a human by using texture mapping. So real objects contain subtle changes in both the color and the orientation that you can't get with color and lighting models. So we can't model these objects with tons of little triangles to capture these changes. So modeling uh, would be too hard and the rendering would be too time consuming. So we use texture mapping to simulate it. So texture mapping handles changes in color. So here's an example where we have a model with a normal size polygons, and then we have a map with a 2D image onto the polygons. So we take this picture and map it onto this surface. Actually, that one does show up. Okay, and then we get this model here, more realistic coloring, more realistic shaping. Because the other thing that slide didn't point out is we might have some imperfections. We might have some inconsistencies. We might have some detail we can't show pixel by excuse me, polygon by polygon, that we can show more realistically with an image. So it adds a little bit more realism to it overall. Um, there's a cost to it, however. You're taking a big old image, and you're storing it 
in a graphics file <laughs> and you're mapping the big old image so you want to make sure you have light small little images you can paint polygon by polygon or you can paint object by object so if you're making let's say a wood floor it'd be a really nice idea to take a picture of wood and texture map it onto a wireframe of a floor you know, maybe with boards or something and then uh, you have a very realistic looking floor same thing as, a, as the earth so the stages of texture mapping there's four different stages of texture mapping you can obtain the texture parameters or the space coordinates from the 3D coordinates using a projector function so we're projecting we're going to get the coordinates that we're going to map then you map the texture parameter space using the texture image whatever it is you're going to apply to it coordinates using the corresponding function to map it and this is all built in for you by the way now we just say texture map and the function is doing this for you you could sample using a sampling technique the you know, textured image at the computed texture space coordinates to see if it fits to see if it overlaps and then you have blending so the blending takes it and makes it so that the object color is even and it doesn't overlap or fall short in terms of its coverage so the projector function texture mapping function is simply a way to get from a 3D point to a 2D point in the texture parameter space. And think of it more like this, the view space for the textured image. So texture parameter space is represented by two coordinates, U and V, both in the range 0 to 1. And so that would be the space. And then we can compute automatically during the rendering process using the intermediate objects for the spherical or the cylinder mapping or the planar mapping, depending upon the type of mapping we chose to use. Or we can use the projector function, can be pre-calculated modeling the results stored from each one of the vertexes, as long as we have the vertex information. So it depends on how we want to map it and what kind of information we want to use for the mapping. So the intermediate objects in the projection function, so it's an imaginary intermediate object placed over the modeled object being textured. Just think of it sort of like wrapping up something. So we're placing something over something else, but it's not filled in correctly yet. Points on the model object are projected onto the intermediate object. So there's a matching between uh, the surface of the texture map to the real surface. And then the texture parameter shape is wrapped onto the intermediate object in some, some sort of a known way. So think about GIF wrapping. <laughs> we're pretty much texture mapping an object with GIF wrapping. Except for our gift wrapping has folds and you cut the surface. If you were not to have any folds, or not to use any tape, and you're just taking the image and you're wrapping it around the object, it's the calculation of the function that's going to really determine which parts are going to be filled in in which order so that you can cover the surface with this wrap. So here are some intermediate project objects in the projector function. But, um, you know, the top and the bottom are sort of red because they haven't been filled in yet, but the outer surfaces have been populated. And now we see the whole thing is wrapped up here into the shape. And this is a real-time rendering. Well, don't see, if you had the book, page 121, I'll give you the real-time rendering concept. So intermediate objects in the OpenGL library I use as a GL text generation function. It allows you to specify the type of and the type of projection function that's being used. So if you think about the concept, it's sort of like you gift wrapping again. It depends upon whether you start with the paper this you know, horizontally or vertically, whether you're wrapping from one end to another end, um, how you're positioning the object over the wrap, all the different choices you have that you can normally specify in the OpenGL library. Soft is used to uh, do special types of mapping, such as environmental mapping, which we'll see in a few minutes. Environmental mapping is going to give us, um, as an example, if we were looking at the, the environment, uh, let's talk about a beach scene. And we have a, a sky, and there's a sun in the sky. Maybe we want the sun on the left, we want the shading to go to the right or something. Then we can use a, what's called an environmental map to set the or origins of what's left and right and then map it accordingly, especially if the scene's not consistent. So. Quadrant objects is uh, quadrant op objects that are basically the same shape as the intermediate object. They have the texture coordinates generated this way. 
is going to be generated. In fact, squares are pretty easy to texture map and rectangles. So pre-computing proje projector functions, the textual coordinates are simply defined at the vertices, and then we have the direct map from the 3D to the 2D parameter space here in terms of the coordinates. So it's just a one-to-one -one mapping if it's just a flat surface in the 2D. So there's a texture editor. So texture editors are used to help manually place the texture coordinates. So we can uh, figure out essentially without having a stretched look or a, I don't know, a condensed or a stretched, we can texture correctly so that the object shape is of the same kind of coordinate system as the texture map. So we don't have to figure out uh, how do we're going to adjust it. So this is kind of like the same thing as when you download an image and make it your desktop. If it fills instead of tiling, it's going to the image is going to stretch and resize itself. But if you did that with somebody's head, and you're going to put that on a 3D model of a person, well, the face is going to look funny if it's all stretched out or if it's all condensed. So you want to get the proportions correctly. So there's modeling tools that allow you to take pictures and texture map them to the objects using the coordinate system to identify distances and how, how many triangles and how many vertices you're going to actually map to a certain way. So that allows you to perfect it to make the face a little bit more realistic. So interpopulating texture coordinates. So texture coordinates only provide the UV values at the vertices of the polygon. So the coordinates are going to give us our center points. So it's going to give us our polygon population. So we still need to fill in each one of the pixel locations in the interiors of the polygons. So which is what the mapping is actually doing. It's taking the image and it's filling up or occupying the entire polygon. So they're filled by by linearly interpopulating the texture parameter coordinates to the 2D space. So if you make your parameters, excuse me, make your polygons match the shape of your image, you'll get a much more realistic texture map. Which is why I was mentioning before, if we're making a hardwood floor and our polygon shapes are more rectangular and they look like boards when we texture map, it will get a much more realistic mapping that occurs with that. In fact, if we make the boards the same shape as the boards in the image, we get even a more realistic thing out of that. So if we make the map of the face round or oval, depending upon the face that we're mapping to it, if we can match the shape of the face a little bit more accurately, we can get it definitely a little bit more realistic. So, And that has to do with the population of the inner polygons and the percentage of fill that you're going to get. So these are filled by bilinearly interpopulating the texture parameter space coordinates in the 2D space. So we've done the same time as we did the interpopulation of the lighting and the depth calculations as well. All this, by the way, is done simultaneously. It's not done in say, phases, it's all done together, which makes the rendering process a challenge, actually. We have all this stuff going on and we need to optimize it to make it happen simultaneously. Otherwise, we get this screen painting and then, oh, there's the light. Oh, there's the texture mapping. Oh, there, and it doesn't seem like a real generation of the image. So, uh, corresponding functions. The corresponding function takes the U and the V values of the maps, maps them into the texture image space. So here we have a 128 pixel by 64 pixel. We have to resize. So correspondence function takes the image, corresponds it to its location, fills the area of the polygon that it's assigned to go into, and provides the mapping. And this is the same thing as when you take and you download that little bitmap image and you put it on your desktop. There's a correspondence between how big the pixel is going to be, how it's represented in terms of the bitmap space that's taking up, given the size of your monitor. So it will be stretched. It provides a stretched or a shrinking look, depending upon what you're doing with it. So the functions allow us to change the size of the image, which is what I'm calling the stretch or the shrink used, without having to redefine our projection function or redefine our texture coordinates. So map to subsections of the image and specify what happens outside of the range. It might be disappeared, it might be cut off, it might not be rendered. So, so mapping to a subsection allows you to store several small texture images into a single large texture image. And uh, by default, it maps the entire texture image. This would be a good example on the wood. Take the wood beams that are 
of certain characteristics and apply them to certain pixels, or certain areas of the artificial floor that you're texturing. I want to give you a simulated of the subsections. What happens outside the area that's not being texture mapped? The object is only as big as the object is, and then you have the image that's being mapped to it. You cut off the ends of it. Kind of like what happens to the end of that of the wrapping paper when you cut it off? <laughs> you take down the ends. Three main approaches. You can repeat and tile. So the image is repeated multiple times by simply dropping the integral part of the value and just repeating it. Or it might be clamped, so the values are clamped to the range, resulting in the edge values being repeated, but not the entire image. Or there might be a border around the image, so the values outside the range are displayed in a given border color. Very similar to what happens with your um, desktop, again. So you take that image, you download it, you can tile it. You tile it, you're repeating it to fill the area. Sometimes you see two tiles, sometimes you see four. Depends on how many, how big the image is. If you don't, you just do a border, you put it in the middle, and then you have the outside showing. The repeater of the tile, stretch the image over the entire desktop so it fills up without a border, which is kind of very similar in concept, but this is what we're doing with texture mapping. When we map an image to your desktop, you're texture mapping it, by the way, <laughs> because you're taking an image and you're painting your desktop with it in concept. So we have the concept of sampling that comes into place. So in general, the size of the texture image and the size of the projected surface is not the same. So we have to sample. When we sample, we get a feel for the pattern. Then we can take and realistically repeat the pattern if the object is bigger, or reduce the pattern if the object is smaller. So if the size of the projected surface is larger than the size of the textured image, then the image will need to be blown up to fit the surface. I call that uh, magnif... well, the slide is calling it magnification, I'm calling it stretching. <laughs> you blow it up, you stretch it out so it fits the surface. Or minification, which is the shrinkage, or the condensing down, so if the size of the projected surface is smaller than the size of the textured image, then the image is going to need to be shrunk down to fit into the surface. The process is called minification. So here's our ma magnification. So. You don't necessarily have to call it minimizing and maximizing. You can call it shrinking, which is uh, common for minimizing, or stretching, which is maximizing. So I use lower tech terms on this. So recall that there are more pixels than textiles in a magnification. You have to fill in the textiles to the pixels. You have too many pixels. So, so that you need to sample the textiles for each one of the pixels to determine the textiles' texture color. That is, there's a one-to-one -one correlation. If you sample, you take a piece of it, and you're detecting the pattern of the colors. And you're going to take and you're going to repeat the pattern of the cover to add in more pixels where no pixels existed. So you're interpopulating pixels artificially to fill in the image, which distorts it, if you think about it, because it might not fill it in correctly. So some things look good magnified, and some don't, actually, depending upon how the pixels are filled in. So there's two main ways to sample textiles, nearest neighbor or the bilinear interpopulation. Because this would be the calculation that would have to be performed to figure out how are you going to fill in all of those pixels that don't have a value associated to them from the textiles that we need to make up values for. If we use the nearest neighbor, we copy the nearest neighbor, which is what you would do in a paint program, actually. If you've ever done that when you've stretched out an image and you go, oh look, there's a big hole in it, and then you cut and paste and you fill it in with the neighbors, now with the neighboring pieces to get rid of the hole, like touch up. So sampling the simple pics, the textile closest to the projected pixel and copies it. If we're going to use a bilinear interpopulation, we're going to do a calculation on all more than one neighbor. So we sample four textiles closest to the projected pixel and linear interpopulate their values in both the horizontal and the vertical directions. Bigger sample set, smaller sample set, both have pros and cons associated with them. So here's an example of magnification. The nearest neighbor can give a crispy feel than uh, the little magnification that is occurring, but the bilinear is usually the safer choice. 
So we have the bilinear also takes up four times as long because we have to do more calculations. So if we do pixel by pixel neighboring pixel, which is what this one's doing, so this is the pixel by pixel, this is the bilinear, this is a little bit fuzzier, this is a little bit more boxier. So if you've ever done this with a paint program, it's easy to simulate. Just blow an image up and you'll see this magnified out, the paint program does it for you automatically. So you start seeing the squares, yes? What's um, It's more realistic because it's taking more than just the neighbor, it's taking the four quadrants around it and it's taking that and doing a calculation on it to smooth it. So what ends up happening, if you notice this list, probably can't tell, but this one's a little bit more fuzzier because it's a smoothing between the neighbors. It's not an exact pixel to pixel copy like this one is. You can see the boxes on the pixels. So it gives you a more realistic approach to it. It takes four times as long to calculate it because you're looking at four pixel values instead of just one. And the, it, gives, it produces more realistic, safer choices because it's doing a better sampling. Because there might be a light contrast. And here you see like this line that occurs here. So I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, I'm pointing my mouse over this kind of almost a straight line. But there's no straight line over here. So it artificially filled it in incorrectly because it only sampled one pixel at a time. So this is going to be boxier, line, more lines, more less of a transition between all the vertices. This is going to be more of a transitional smoothing between the vertices, more realistic, fuzzier. Because it's not an exact, it's an approximation. So although this looks a little bit more realistic to some. However, you usually have choices. <laughs> so if you have a more expensive graphic package, you're going to have choices in terms of the kind of rendering that's being done. But that's a good question. Uh, so let's see. So we can do the opposite. So usually magnification is the problem. Minification is usually easier. The only problem with that is getting the visual, getting the image visible. Here the image is visible, but we're missing pieces because we took it and we stretched it out. Now we have to fill in where there's no texel associated with the pixel. So there's no, nothing to populate the pixel with, so we're artificially supplementing it in. To minify it, we have to pull out stuff to make it smaller. And then it's easier because you can't see it as well. You don't have as much detail. And so the algorithms are a little bit easier to do because we're just cutting out stuff. And we can approximate what we're going to cut out. So recall that there's more textiles than pixels in this particular case. Thus we need to integrate colors from many different textiles into form a pixel texture color. So our integration of all the associated textiles is nearly impossible in real time. So we need to use another sampling technique. So I have two common sampling techniques that we're going to use and they're very similar to the other sampling techniques, which is the same techniques. So the nearest neighbor or the bilinear interpopulation can be used as well for minification. So, and it's the same technique. So we either sample the textual, textual value at the center of the group and associated textiles and get rid of everything else around it. Or we sample four textual values in the group and associated and then we do a bilinear interpopulation of them. So now the sampling techniques are the same for magnification, but the results are quite different. So for the nearest neighbor, there's a severe aliasing artifacts can be seen. Well, because you're removing some pretty important information. So they're given noticeable, they're even more noticeable as the surface moves with respect to the viewer. So for temporal aliasing. Uh, I don't know if I have pictures for the by. I do have a picture coming up. No, I don't have a picture of this. Uh, because it has a tendency not to look good in terms of pictures. Uh, so for the uh, minification, we have artifacts that are introduced because we're actually changing the image by taking it out. And for the bilinear interpopulation, it's only slightly better than the nearest neighbor minification. There's more than four pixels needed to be integrated together. This filtering shows the same aliasing artifacts as the nearest neighbor does, actually. And down here, if you have the book for the course, it's actually in a couple of the different exercises. There's a some source code written in C that's being used in uh, object as a, no, uh, OpenGL, the C library that uh, can 
you can see the effects actually. So, uh, both minification and magnification, the thing to keep in mind causes distortion. And distortion in computer graphics terms is called artifacts. We introduce artifacts, which are things that we put into the image that didn't exist. So we give them different characteristics, which is the same thing that happens actually when you take something and you shrink it down. And, oh, it looks like a melon. Oh, no, it's a baseball. Or, you know, depending upon how you're populating the, that you're taking, removing, and populating the existing pixels, it's going to change the shape or it's going to change the idea of the concept. MIP maps. So MIP stands for multiple, mul multum in parvo, which is Latin for many things in a small space, small place. So we take, and, uh, and here's actually a nice good picture of it. The basic idea is to improve minimization by improving down sampling versions of the original texture map. So a pyramid of texture images. Which is the interesting thing, we can apply this to the opposite maximization, but it doesn't lend itself to the same uh, level of um, improvement. If we're going to need to minimize something, it's nice to be able to take and make the image smaller. If we take and make the image smaller, then we can map it to the shape more accurately, and we have less minimization to actually be performed. So we have the original texture, and then we have predefined filtered images that come out of it. We do this in web design all the time. You pick a smaller image. Because if you scale the smaller image down, it doesn't scale down as nicely. Sometimes it can make it bigger. It's going to look nicer than if you scale it down. So otherwise, what you do is you pick the pixel ratio. You, you, know, you pick the size of the icon that mats, matches what, how you're going to present it in terms of the image, and then you've got a better mapping. So mit mapping, making it smaller and fitting into a smaller space. When minification would normally occur instead of use the MIP map, MIP map image that most closely matches the size of the projected surface. And then you don't have to perform minification. So the projected surface falls in between a MIP map and the images. Use the nearest neighbor to pick up the MIP map image closest to the projected surface size. Or use a linear interpopulation to pick up the combined values from the two closest MIP map images. So sampling in OpenGL can be done using just select a minification filter, nearest or linear. So both choices are available. So it allows you to select the minification filter from the nearest or the linear without MIP mapping, or the nearest or the linear text will sample with the nearest or linear MIP map selection from four distinct choices that you have to, uh, to choose from. So you can play around with it if you're familiar with OpenGL and you want to play around with it. In uh, VRML, you have texture on, texture off. <laughs> It does it for you automatically. So you don't have too many options to pick from in terms of the properties of the shape. I'm surprised it actually even supports texture mapping, but it does. So and we've seen that in one of our examples already as well. So blending the texture value. So once the sample texture value has been obtained, we have to blend it between the polygons. Because what we're doing is we're painting polygon by polygon and then we're going to see the polygon shapes underneath the image unless we blend it. So we need to blend it with the computed color value. So there are three ways to perform the blending. Replace, decal, and modulate. So in a replacement technique, we replace the computed color with a texture color, effectively removing all of the lighting. Because we're not considering lighting at this point, we're just replacing. So we take and the, the, the section that's in between that's being blended is just going to be colored again by whatever happens to be in the nearest neighbor or whichever replacement algorithm we select. We can decal, so it's like replacement, but transparent parts of the texture are blended with the underlying computer color. So it's like taking the color, not the image texture, uh, excuse me, image textile, and blending it with the color, underlying color. And then uh, modulate, uh, which is multiply the texture color by the computed color, producing a shade of the textured surface, which is a little bit more realistic, actually. So blending restrictions. The main problem with the sample form of texture mapping is blending it so that it only blends with the final computed color. So it's not using the original image, it's using the computed image 
a computed color, depending upon what we're blending, it's being applied. Uh, so what ends up happening is if you catch it too on, you're not blending it with the right color, and then you actually see the line and it accentuates it instead of blending it, it does the opposite. So the texture will dim both the diffuse and the specular terms, uh, which will can look unnatural, actually. And so a dark object may may uh, objects still may have a bright highlight to them. So if you blend it, it might not look right. So if the diffuse and the specular components can be interpopulated across the pixels independently, then you can blend the texture with just the diffuse and not have to worry about the highlighted areas. So that's not part of the classical rendering pipeline, but several vendors have tried to add implementations for different blending techniques. So usually you'll see different options for blending. So texture set management. So each graphic card can handle a certain number of textures in memory at one time. This is the problem with texture mapping and texture images. They're big. They're graphic images, which take a lot of time to process and takes a lot of memory. So even though memory in a 3D cards uh, has increased uh, dramatically recently, the rule of thumb is that you never have enough texture memory. You always run out of texture memory. So a card usually has a built-in strategy, like at least, re least, least recently used um, algorithm to manage the work you set. So it pulls out what you haven't used recently, thinking that you're not going to render it. Because we are still looking at memory. Because in a perfect world, we would just take all these images, right? Texture map them onto objects, and we wouldn't have to worry about any shading or lighting, coloring or anything. We'd have the real picture. Impossible to do without a lot of memory, because we can't hold all of those images. So OpenGL allows you to set priorities on the textures to enable you to adjust this process. Unless you're doing a lot of texture um, capturing and you're saving a lot of images, you're not necessarily going to run into this problem, usually. We also have the concept of viewport mapping. So this is the final transformation that occurs in the classic rendering pipeline. So the viewport transformation simply maps the generated 2D image to the portion of the 3D window used to display it. It's just the mapping for the view. If you want to think of it as a, you know, it's a viewport mapping. By default, the entire window is used, unless you have a subsection of the window blocked off, and that's going to be the rendering part. So it's useful if you want several different views in the scene in the same window. You can actually map it out using the viewport settings and mapping. So believe it or not, in fact, in order to really put this into perspective, I have to go back to the beginning and show you the pipeline. What we're really, what I really have done over the last two weeks, is gone through whoops, this processing. So the viewport mapping is what gives us the 2D image that is going to be on the screen space. Normalizing the device space is part of the texturizing. So texturizing falls into the normalization process. So we have our model, our artificial model that we've created in our tool set. We've applied model and view transformations using matrix calculations for rotation and translation. You know, we have the things that we have capabilities for. And we've defined them in a view space. We've provided the projections, projections, and we've also provided the projections kind of also include camera, view angle, all of the different characteristics, shading and lighting and all those things, down into the normalizing device space. And normalizing device space is where we're going to figure out how we're going to texture map, saving all the information associated with all of the pixels, all of the final resulted rendering in terms of the data, and the buffered information, which gets projected out into the viewport mapping, which ends up on our screen space. So. In kind of a roundabout way, this is the this is the classic rendering pipeline <laughs> in terms of computer graphics and how it goes from a computer program to a computer screen from a 3D to a 2D, and it still maintains its 3D properties. So what we're going to do next, because we still have some time left, is look at lecture number GDS for graphic device. Oops systems, graphic device systems, which is our next lecture. And if you're wondering, these lectures are located out here. Well, not here. Let's see, they're located hacker.com. Computer graphics. Uh, let's see. 
lectures. The ones I've been going over are the ones down here. So the rendering pipeline, this is the one I just looked at a few minutes ago we've been going over. I'm working up to this next one's called graphic device systems. So this is where I'm getting this one from. I find this to be a little bit more interesting than going through all of these uh, 42 individual lectures. So, However, if you thumb through all this stuff, you'll find some interesting, more details and interesting concepts uh, that I'm going over in these lectures here. So that's where I'm getting this lecture from, by the way. So we're going to start graphic device systems. A little bit lighter weight, you'll appreciate this after going through that last lecture. So. I, um, when I say you're going to appreciate it, it's because you can probably relate to it more because it has something to do with computer science and it has something to do with you know, device systems. So graphic device systems play an important part. They're both hardware and software and they're oriented to how the graphic system is going to work. So graphic system, there's five major elements of a computer graphic system. Graphics processors, memories, frame buffers, input devices, and output devices. What we've been looking at was the rendering pipeline that uses the processor and the memory and the frame buffer to take the input device and turn it into the output device. That's where this pipeline concept fits into place when we talk about graphic systems, graphic pipelines. So here's our five major components. What I'm going to do in this lecture is kind of go over each one of them and kind of figure out, well, if I'm building a graphic system, what are my main concerns in terms of these components? We have output technology, which most of us see and realize in our day-to-day -day life. We have Game Boy systems, Wii systems, uh, TVs, computers, all sorts of different displays for which we look at graphics. So we have uh, color graphic displays, also called vectors or stroke or line drawing graphics, which is one method of um, displays through history. So, display processor directs electron beams according to a list of lines defined by a display list. So, we keep a buffered information. This is primarily why graphic displays need buffer information. They need memory and they need a graphic processor. Because you have to take the arrays, the lists, the data structures that are full of the graphic information and populate it out. How are you going to populate it out? Well, there's a system. The hardware itself has a system to it. It's either going to draw line by line, pixel by pixel, um, it's going to run, it's going to render the image to the graphic display in a certain format that it's designed to work with, which is why we had different cards for different types of displays, because they're optimized for each one of the different techniques. So vector stroke or line drawing graphics is what this is referring to. And uh, phosphors are glow for only a few microseconds, so the lines can be drawn and refreshed constantly. Uh, deflected uh, speed limit, number of lines that can be drawn without flickering. Uh, look at old television sets and you'll see this line drawing thing. In fact, you see it when you have an old worn out television set and you have the lines that go left to right or right to left or they go up and down. And you have flickering and you have lines that are disappearing. Those are line drawn systems, by the way. LCD is current stuff, not line drawn. Raster displays. So displays primitives, lines, shapes, regions, characters, stored as pixels, and we have a refresh buffer or a frame buffer that gives us the pixel population. And then we have burnt out pixels. <laughs> so what goes wrong with raster displays? Black spots on the screen. So in fact you'll see it on your monitors actually, on cheaper monitors, you'll see black dots that never go away even after you wash the screen a hundred times, because it's not on the screen. It's the pixel phosphorus that's underneath it that's representing the pixel space that's broken. It doesn't have power to it or something. Common, common. The better quality screens don't have as many burnt out pixels. Don't have as many, but you know, it used to happen actually with MacBooks a long time ago. Until now, Apple's put so much effort, now we have retina displays. <laughs> we have even better quality displays these days. But in the old days, they never used to be known for good displays. They used to have problems. In fact, if you read old ads on old computers, they'll say, most of the pixels are still live. Like, That's a good thing? Okay. All right, so electron beams scan a regular pattern for horizontal raster lines. They connected by horizontal retraces and vertical retraces. 
and video controllers coordinate and repeat scanning. And pixels are individually dots on the raster line, so the pixels are those little dots that go black on you. So we also have the bitmap, which is a collection of pixels and frame buffers that store the bitmaps. So rather than painting it pixel by pixel, you can paint it bitmap by bitmap, which are regions of the screen. You get this when you watch your digital television, if you ever, uh, I don't know how long you guys have been around here, but if you have digital TV, Comcast is actually a good one for this, and it downloads and then it has a problem, you'll see parts of the picture will change color, and they're being like boxes, huge boxes, those are bitmaps. So it's being painted in multiple pixel packages all at the same time. And sometimes they get corrupted, so like the left-hand side of the screen starts getting fuzzy, but the right hand's okay. <laughs> or it's just a bad connection. It's in the middle of a storm, and uh, you know not all of the pixels are making it correctly, so you see black spots. They're basically you know not populated areas of the screen. So, so those are all the things that can go wrong. Not to be so negative on displays, but usually people notice the problems versus the clarity. Uh, when it's good, nobody complains. So, raster displays store the display primitives, line characters, solid shapes, and pattern areas. Frame buffers are composed of VRAM, video RAM. And video RAM is dual ported memory capable of random access, simultaneously high speed serial output, built in serial shift registers, can output entire scan lines at a high rate, synchronizing the pixel clock. The more RAM, the, more, uh, the larger your frame buffer. The bigger your bitmaps, the better quality of your image. The more data that can be stored, the more data that can be populated. Pros and cons. Advantages of advantages to raster graphics. Low cost. Filled regions, shaded images. Disadvantages to raster graphics. Discrete representation, continuous pr primitives must be scanned, converted to fill the approximate scan lines. A lot of conversion done depending upon the display. Uh, algorithm that's painting the algorithm. Aliasing or jagging it has to be done, so aliases due to sampling error. Uh, actually, it doesn't have to be done, it's a side effect, it's an artifact. Uh, so converting from continuous to discrete representation could cause a problem. So here's our basic definitions, and uh, before I get into this, let me just clarify a point, because most of you look like you've got uh, confusion. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I sense confusion. I don't know why. Um, the raster just okay. So we have the hardware, and then we have the algorithms that are populating the hardwares. The algorithms are built to populate the hardware given the hardware limitations and the hardware characteristics. If we're building something line by line, we're going to use a different type of rendering system, and the graphics card is going to be doing and processing a different type of algorithm. If we're doing it pixel or bitmap by bitmap or pixel by pixel, we're using yet again another different process. So the display is optimized by the graphics card, which is optimized by the graphic processor and the amount of memory that's available. And the algorithm for translating it is we send some code to the graphics card. The graphics card takes the code and then populates, using its algorithm, populates the image that it's supposed to render given the data in the frame buffer, given the image that you're trying to put out there. So different cards work differently, and they have their pros and cons due to the way the technology and the algorithms are working. So that's the differences between most of the graphic displays. So basic definitions. So what do we have here? Raster. So a rectangular array of points or dots. Pixel, or PL, I just call them pixels. One dot or picture element on the raster. And then we have a scan line which is a row of pixels. So if you're using a line drawing display, you're, poppy, you're the graphics card and you're given all this information. Here's what I want you to show on the display. And the line drawing algorithm is going to take and draw pixels by pixels in sequences of lines. So it's going to go zzzz. Older TV sets you can actually see that. <laughs> Especially when the tubes are wearing off and, oh look, there's a line that's empty across the screen. It's because it's drawing it and it's making an error at a certain point, so the entire line is empty. 
versus pixel by pixel versus map area by map area drawing. So it's basically only describing how the pixels are being populated. We, everything works with pixels these days. So are we going to line it, draw it from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen, from the left to the right, from line to line? Or we're going to do what we do today, all at once, pixel by pixel. Throw it out there. Because we never see the image, or in that case, the image is going to be there, or the image is not going to be there. <laughs> you're going to have black, or you're going to have image, or you're going to have fuzzy image, which is what you're going to get out of that. Uh, if you have a fuzzy image, that means you have one of these really big TVs. Let me describe TVs to you. You want higher pixel counts. On monitors, you want a higher pixel counts on TVs. If you get a LC, if you get a really low quality TV, has not as many pixels, and it's a huge, it's like a 60 inch TV, right? You stick a nice, you know, HD TV quality image out there, and it's going to look like crap <laughs> because the pixels, not as many pixels, not as much definition in the image quality, and you're going to get Actually, you're going to get what we just looked at a few minutes ago in terms of the filling in, but we're going to get reduction is what we're going to get because we have to populate images so we have to take out data because we don't have us enough, enough, enough pixels to match the picture that we're trying to map to the image. So the more pixels you have, the better quality of the image because you get more of a direct one-to-one -one mapping. Talk about HDTV, we have almost twice as much information that has to get mapped to the same amount of pixels. So you have converter boxes that you plug in and it takes and it strips out half the HD TV so you have fewer pixels and the picture actually looks better. <laughs> because it's still populating but it's not taking, you're not seeing HD TV because it's converting all the digital into, it's not really going into analog, it's still digital, but it's reducing it so it looks better on your TV and can actually show correctly. Otherwise what ends up happening is the picture can't be viewed. So you click on stations that have discramblers on it. What they do, is to solve you the mystery of cable television, if you don't subscribe to something, you don't get it. But if you slip, turn to the station that has it, you have an algorithm that is applied to descramble. If it's not descrambled, it's going to descramble. If it's scrambled, what they do is they just rotate. So sometimes you see the picture turned around backwards, <laughs> or you see the picture upside down, or you see half the picture over here interlaced or interpopulated so you see because the algorithm is causing the picture to to mess up but you're still getting the picture you always get the picture but the rendering of the algorithm that's rendering the data to put it on the display is not decrypting it correctly it's, you don't have it you haven't paid for that station yet but that has nothing to do with how pixels are populated but uh, it's just a little background on the concept so video rest so next time you go to uh, Next time you go to buy a monitor, <laughs> higher pixel rate, higher, higher, higher. And they used to call it dots per inch, you know, you know the, the, the dot ratio. And the, you know, actually, now there's different technology out. We have liquid dis crystal displays, and we have, you know, different types of devices that are out there. Um, but in the old days, for this concept to be effective, you want smaller number of squares. And it gives you more number of pixels. Um, so the video raster display here displays an image by sequence, sequentially drawing out the pixels of the scan lines and forms the raster. So that forms the raster that we're looking at. So here we have the resolution. So actually you can see this on your computer screen, you know, the 1024 by 768. Not bad. In fact, that's what you're looking at, 1024 by 768. My computer's got more like a 1280 by 1024. Actually, I've got higher. I've got like 14-something 14, 14 by, um, I don't know, by 12-something probably. Um, what is that going to tell you? The dots per inch. It's going to tell you the, how many pixels are actually being shown. Depends on the quality of the monitor. So if the monitor only supports, which is what this thing supports, it's only going to show it to the same pixel level. So it's going to feed out the information from the graphics card to this thing to project it at a certain ratio. So what does all this mean? The resolution is the n maximum number of points that can be displayed without overlapping on a CRT monitor. That's what it actually came from by definition. It depends on the type of phosphorus uh, material that's being used, the intensity to be displayed on the M for the monitor, and the focus or the deflection system. 
and it usually has to do with your pixel ratio. So your pixel ratio is, is going to be determined by this number. So Here's an example of your television set. You know your TV, your old TV, was actually pretty low. It was 640 by 480. You know what it is on an iPod? 320 by 240. <laughs> but it looks pretty good, doesn't it? Which, if you put video on an iPod, or actually, not the retinas. The older iPod, the older the older iPad resolution was 320 by 240 for video, but if you made it small, you don't want that many pixels. <laughs> you want it smaller. The resolution gets smaller and it makes the image look better, actually. It looks clear on a smaller screen. You put a large one on there, not so good. You put that 320 by 240 on a huge screen like this one, not so good. because <laughs> you're mapping it incorrectly. Your number, amount of data is not being mapped to the pixels to one to one. You have to, you're either doing an interpopulation technique or you're doing a neighbor, neighbor analysis. You have to do something in order to uh, fill in the missing information because you took something that was small and made it bigger. Now you have extra pixel, pixels. What do, we, what do we illuminate those extra pickle, pixels with? So we have algorithms to fill it in. So that what makes it look blurry, makes it look out of focus. So it looks better on the smaller screen. HD TV, this is our current, this is much higher, 1920 by 1080, which is kind of a mm, much much more improvement than your 640 by 480. Your bitmap displays are a bit bigger on workstations. Laser printers are pretty, pretty low. They're in dot, dots per inch or DPI, which is going to give us our resolution. Higher dot print, dot per inch, in fact, most of them are what what are they right now? Between three and six hundred dots per inch on your average consumer grade printer. You get you get a color photo printer, higher dots per inch, because <laughs> it's going to be matching the film, which is going to be higher. So, and then that's why you print out pictures on your laser printer. And it looks like crap because, well, actually you'll have white spaces and you'll have blurriness and it won't look as sharp or as clean because it's filling in or it's removing depending upon what you're doing with it. If the picture, if you have more information that's going to fit in the, in, the, in the dots per inch that are available, then it's removing. So, found 35 millimeter diagonal, we're looking at 3,000 millimeters, so we're going to leave a little bit more in terms of that. So, We also have aspect ratio that we use to keep in, in fact most people are familiar with this because they've set their computers or they've set their television settings. This is where this is coming into place. So it's part of the graphic system because we want to modify and we want to we want to tailor the graphic to meet the aspect ratio <laughs> or to meet the pixel. You know, because if we don't know if we don't keep in mind the graphic system, then we're making graphics for something non realistic. You know, we're not optimizing the benefits that we're gonna get by tailoring it towards the system we're interested in. So in terms of an aspect ratio, we've got the frame aspect ratio or the FAR, which is the horizontal vertical. So most TVs are four, four to three. HD TV 16 to nine, 16 by nine. So it's wider than it is longer. Your screen, your MacBooks are 16 by nine. Your flat square Windows machines are four by three usually. They're not, they're not widescreen. So 16 by nine would be widescreen. Page is eight and a half by 11 or eight, eight and a half by three quarters. 35 millimeters, a three two ratio, really squarish. Panda television, Vista version, different types of different panoramic settings that can be set. We're going to give you wider panoramic views, two to one or 1.5. So pixel aspect ratio is the nuisance in the graphics. If it's not one, it's less than one. So it's the pixel access ratio. Um, physical size, it's also going by the length of the screen, diagonally, so it's usually measured in diagonal, typical 12 by 27 inches. If you're thinking about measuring, well that's an interesting thing too, is people when they look at monitors, no one buys monitors anymore because they don't buy desktop computers anymore, but you buy TV sets. And you go, well this one's a 60 inch diagonal. Well, usually now they put the word diagonal because people were measuring, well, isn't that 60 inches wide? No, it's 60 in diagonal, so it's always diagonal measurements. Same thing with computers. This is 11 and a half inches diagonally, <laughs> theoretically. Actually, the viewing, 
frame is 11 and a half. The, the screen itself is bigger, but the view is set to that, which is interesting because what they did is they took a size monitor screen and optimized it graphically so that it would render in the best look and they had to make it a little bit smaller in order to do that actually than the physical capabilities of the screen. So usually you don't mess with that. Usually you can't. The graphics card is going to be set for something that's going to be hard set on the hardware that's going to tell me that this is the viewable area of the screen that you're able to look at. So we have refresh rates uh, and bandwidths, frames per second, film we have double frame, 24 frames per second. We are more primarily concerned with frames per second when we start um, converting from one format to another. We take an MOV file and change it to an MP4 file. Not a bad idea to match the frames per second because you have audio and video syncing in that case and they have to change the frame per seconds. Frame per seconds. The video is going to run slower or faster because you're populating out each one of the frames at different speeds, perhaps, or you're taking and not calculating all the frames and you're losing frames if you change it. And then the audio doesn't match with the video. <laughs> so you see classic with the dubbed films, you know, the English translations they put over Chinese films and vice versa. It never matches up correct. Actually, some of them, they're getting a lot better with that. But the trick is to match the frames per second. So you have the audio and the video syncing up. Otherwise, the audio is going to run too fast. Or the video is going to run too fast. Depending upon what you're looking at. Higher frames per second, better clarity in the image. So HDTV has a higher frames per second ratio than regular broadcast television. And your TV set is only able, the older TV sets didn't have a high ratio are limited by their capabilities of refreshing frames. So each frame, imagine it as a, I don't know, remember those little flipboard things? You flip it up and you can see, you know, each one of the pages of the frame. <laughs> How many of them are you going to have per second? The net, the fewest number of things, you guys know what I'm talking about? You ever write cartoons? As kids we did this, we wrote cartoons this way, you know. You have like 50 pieces of paper, and you write, and slightly different, so you can get the arm to go up, and the arm goes down. You draw the same character 50 different times, but you adjust it slightly, so when you flip them up this way, all these frames per second, <laughs> the thing moves, and you can go faster, and, uh, you know, it'll move faster, but all you're looking at is the detail, so the n highest number of frames, the more detail you're going to see, because the more smoothness of the transition you're going to see, so you get jerkiness, lower frames, you get jerkiness, less information, um, not as much, the animation is not quite as good. Um, so you want higher frames. In fact, the digital cameras these days are doing a really good job increasing that. So frames per second, so film, double frame, this is an old spec, I'm pretty sure it's pretty high, much higher, could be a little bit higher now. TV interlaced is 8 megabits, so 30 frames per second. Uh, but it's interlaced, so we're taking two divide. We're we're only getting a, a bit of it. We're not getting all of it. So, in terms of a workstation or a power horse graphic machine, not interlaced, we're getting 375 megabits or 75 frames per second. So, you don't have to really worry about that. The only thing you have to do is figure out well, what frames per second was this recorded in, and I'm going to translate it from this format to that format. Match the frames per second as closely as possible. Otherwise, you're going to lose frames. And if you lose frames, you're going to lose detail. And then all of a sudden, your movie's going to be real jerky. And the audio is not going to sync up correctly. <laughs> because you have audio that doesn't match the video at that point. So, apples and apples. Obviously, the more frames, the more clarity. The fast, smoother movement, the more realistic something is going to look. So, Interlace scanning. And I'm, don't worry about it. I'm getting done here. I'm going to stop soon. Uh, scanning frames 30 times per second. So scan frame is 30 times per second. To reduce the flickering, you divide frames out into two fields. One is consistent with, with an even scan lines and the other one is an odd scan lines. And then we get things where we can do things simultaneously. So paint even and odd together, separate them out into two different buffers, and then we get interlaced. So even and odd fields are scanned out alternatively to produce an interlaced image. 
So it's really taking the frames, dividing them that into two, and then painting them simultaneously in two different directions. Much faster. So we're talking about the frame buffers. So by definition, what is this frame buffer? It keeps track of all the information. This frame buffer is characterized by a size x, y, and pixel depth. So the resolution of the frame buffer is the number of pixels in the display. 1024 by 1024 pixels is this little box here. These are the pixels. This is the resolution. It's by how many is going to fit in the frame buffer, which is going to determine our resolution. So bit planes or bit depth is the number of pixels corresponding to each pixel, is the number of bits corresponding to each pixel. This determines the color resolution of the buffer. So how much information are we going to be able to store about, store about the color to populate out from the bits to the pixels? Bi-level monochrome displays have one bit pixels. There's only one color, an on or an off. And then 8-bit pixels for 256 simultaneous colors, 24-bit pixels for 16 simultaneous colors. So your monitors are adjusted, usually at the highest. So more bits, more memory, more bits that are allocated per pixel, the more color information, the higher number of colors that can be stored. So retina displays, higher number of colors. <laughs> more color, actually. Lots of bits associated with each pixel. More information can render it more realistically. Clear, less artifacts, or fewer artifacts, I should say, to be proper. OK, so this is a good spot. We're going to talk about color systems next time. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is a good stop. This is a good time to stop, actually. Um, unless you guys want more. We can go for it. No, you're shaking your head. No, no. All right, so uh, this is a good transitional spot. Um, this color, you want, you know, everyone wants to know about color. So someone remind me that we stopped on slide number 15. Um, which is uh, the start of the color systems. So I'm going to RGB, we'll go into color patterns and memory associated with colors and bits of data that are associated with pixels to populate colors, and the different color technologies that are applied. So we'll save that for next week. Questions, comments, or concerns? I think you're going to have a midterm coming up, actually. I'll take a few minutes here while I'm still recording to see if the midterm is out. I know my graphics uh, HTML class, I have to give them their midterm. Uh, take home midterm exam, and yours is not here yet. Next week, I'm going to tell you about the midterm exam. And TA, remind me next week, I'm supposed to talk about the midterm. I have to upload it. I haven't uploaded it yet. So I'll populate this with your midterm, and it'll be easy. It'll probably be definitional stuff. We're going to be more of a scavenger hunt. It's a take-home midterm, by the way, um, and you'll have a couple weeks at best, or most, probably more than a couple weeks to do it. So we're about the midpoint in the term. Actually, let me stop this. Yeah.